everyone. Welcome back to Boom Talk. Today, teaching myself to make a homemade blasting cap. And if this works, it'll be step one in making our own improvised explosive. Might be headed to Texas for the winter. What's in Texas? This project. What kind of project? Welcome to Non-Toxic. I'm Andrew Lewis. And I'm Daniel Penny. In this episode, we're joined by Daniel Goldhaber, co-writer and director of the new movie, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, along with fellow co-writers, Jordan Scholl and Dan Garber. The film is adapted from a book by the same name, written by Swedish political theorist Andreas Ma. It's a manifesto of sorts, calling for a more militant environmental movement after years of peaceful and largely unsuccessful efforts to get governments to curb carbon emissions. Mom's book is an academic text, and as you might guess, that's not the type of thing that often gets made into a movie. But Goldhaber found a way, a pretty compelling way, I think. We're introduced to a ragtag bunch of college kids, activists, and people whose lives have been upended by fossil fuels, and who've decided to take direct action by attacking an oil pipeline in West Texas, a crucial node in the global oil market. The goal is to spook investors by showing the world how vulnerable and volatile our addiction to fossil fuels is. This would make future investment unattractive because it would be too risky. And Daniel, didn't something like this actually happen in real life? Yes, it did. On April 20th, 2020, Earth Day, by the way, a time when no one was driving and wildlife seemed to be taking back the streets, the price of oil futures in a type of crude called West Texas Intermediate tanked from $18 to negative 37. So this means sellers were paying customers to take barrels of oil off their hands because they had nowhere to store it. And it was kind of a crazy moment. A lot of folks in climate activism hoped that it was going to be this watershed, but then pandemic restrictions began to ease and people started driving again. Russia invaded Ukraine, which constricted the supply, and the Biden administration approved the Willow Project. It's been a few very good years for the oil industry, in fact. They've made record profits. So what we had all hoped would happen back in 2020 has not come to pass. Yeah. The pandemic, it, it caused seismic shifts across global culture, right? But then it barely rattled the, the fossil fuel industry. So it begs the question, what kind of shock will it, you know, will it take to wake us all up? And I think how to blow up a pipeline, it, it tries to sketch out one possible answer. Daniel, you took the lead with the pipeline crew this week. And before we jump into it, I just want to note that according to Rolling Stone, at least, the FBI actually issued some kind of alert about this film. So maybe it's worth addressing up front. Does it actually teach you how to blow up a pipeline? Not quite. It gives a pretty accurate picture of the sort of process that would be involved, like how an affinity group might connect what goes into making blasting caps, turning fertilizer into explosives. But there are some key ingredients missing, so folks, don't try this at home. But the movie has actually been pretty controversial. It's gotten 4.5 stars on Rotten Tomatoes, but it's also been called sociopathic filmmaking by the conservative National Review. And Fox even ran a segment on it in which none of the hosts seemed to have seen the film but they were certain that it was somehow linked to bans on plastic cutlery. Climate craziness reaching a new level. A new film is out called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And you guessed it. It pushes climate activists to sabotage a Texas oil pipeline to stop that evil fossil fuels production. I mean, th this is, is ridiculous, but also dangerous. Rolling Stone is actually pushing, saying violence is the way to, to deal with the climate, you know, the climate problem, if you believe that there is one. You know, and then, and then you mentioned New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Look, they want to like, I mean, you know what that's going to do to businesses in New Jersey if you have to get rid of all of those plastic forks and those plastic utensils? <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. All in the name of climate change. Everything is about climate change. Wow. Fascinating. So, folks, here's Daniel talking with Daniel Goldhaber, Jordan Scholl, and Dan Garber about their new film. How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Thank you again for joining us this 
Sunday afternoon. We really appreciate it. We're excited to talk about the film, the journey that you all went on from just, I guess, reading Andreas Malm's book to now here with the film entering the public discourse and having a life of its own. So I thought we could start by going back a little bit. And this question is for all three of you. I'm curious to hear about your background with environmental and climate politics, like whenever it is that you became aware of climate and maybe aware of it as a political subject rather than just a thing happening in the world. This is Daniel Gold Hayward speaking. My parents both work in climate science. My mom has worked in climate science my whole life. So I very much grew up with at the very least, at the beginning, kind of the doom of, of climate change hanging over me back before it was something that you were really allowed to discuss in polite political conversation. I think that you would still kind of perpetually get into this this conversation about whether or not it existed. And, and so I very much grew up in this moment where awareness was kind of everything, building awareness and acceptance around climate change was what was so necessary because I think that there is this sense where, okay, well, once we kind of acknowledge that this apocalyptic problem exists, the system will obviously begin to then deal with it appropriately. That was the kind of mainstream rhetoric, but I think that that was also something that I think was for me very evidently always flawed. So my first jobs in film were actually working on climate documentaries, a lot of very well-intentioned storytelling and filmmaking, but that was ultimately often politically toothless. I think that even at that time when I was very young working on those films, I think I had a lot of frustration that, you know, the kind of climate awareness industry was really just spreading a, a very depressing message without a solution. What about you, Dan, and, and you, Jordan? I assume that your parents weren't also climate scientists. How did you come to the subject? This is Jordan Scholl talking. I grew up in Wyoming and like sort of hiking in the Tetons. And there was just like a glacier, the South Teton Glacier that we would hike to every summer. This was while I was a very young person and we were being taught about climate change in school, but it was, it was spoken about as a problem that will arrive someday, as something that will come in the future. And also something that is sort of maximally abstract. And I remember climbing up to that glacier every year and every year getting smaller and smaller until it essentially disappeared. That was the moment for me as a young person that, that sort of brought the problem home and said, this isn't something for the future. It's not something for far away. It's now and it's here and it's going to, it's going to touch everybody. And Dan, what about you? I grew up in California and of course I think California is, is a state that is in many ways already feeling, feeling the effects of climate change and seeing family members have to worry about encroaching fires is definitely a potent reminder of just how much this, this surrounds us and how overdue and, and belated these efforts to stop climate change are. And it's interesting, each of you kind of talking about specific moments or maybe kind of general threats. I think that's mirrored in the characters and their various motivations for coming together to actually make some kind of change. I'm hoping to hear a little bit about that process of adaptation. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that was Jordan's idea is is he's been, Jordan is an academic, he actually just got his PhD. Yay, Jordan, uh, congrats. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So he has come to the film industry and to our collaboration kind of through the side door. And something that we've often talked about in kind of this era of IT adaptation in Hollywood is, you know, why not adapt an academic text? I started reading the book and I think it was, you know, it was, it was kind of months of different conversations that we'd been having together and it kind of clicked the whole thing into place. But for me, the, the original inspiration point was just, was the image of a bunch of kids in the desert struggling with a bomb and this notion of what if we tell a story that just delivers literally on the title of the book. Then there were just a lot of other conversations that we had with everybody from bomb experts to pipeline experts to, you know, activists. I've heard you talk about Ocean's Eleven and other kind of heist films as the genres that you were looking to 
in adapting what is really like an argument driven text into a narrative, because I think that's a really difficult challenge when you have something that is, you know, essentially an argument. It's not about storytelling and figuring out a way to make that a story that feels authentic. Can you talk about that? You know, in the way that a heist film is a sneaky, fun way to interrogate contemporary inequality, this is a movie that's doing that, but just interrogating the contemporary inequality of the day, which is often, you know, about climate. And I think that, you know, we also really wanted to kind of engage with like this idea of a complicated leader and, and, and at times a morally a morally complex character in the character of Sochi is somebody who has a, a great strategic mind, but is a little bit sociopathic, is driven by a bit of a martyr complex. There were a lot of conversations in terms of just the breakdown of the group. He had been really inspired by the stories of like Jessica Reznicek and Ruby Montoya who sabotaged the Dakota Access Pipeline, a number of other kind of Latina female activists that grew up outside of a refinery town that were profiled in Wen Stevenson's book, What We Are Fighting For Is Each Other. But, you know, it is a, it is a fairly balanced group in terms of in terms of gender. And, you know, Sean is very much kind of the co-leader of the group as well. We were just trying to kind of, again, capture as much of a cross-section of the movement as we could. Why was that important? If you want to build a successful political movement, coalition building is the name of the game. And that's something that often the climate movement has done quite a poor job of. But I think that climate, luckily, is something that is both a bit of a political catch-all and something that is a universal problem that everybody is dealing with right now. And so I think that if there is something aspirational as well about the movie, it is that, like, coalition building is possible. There's one character in particular, and that's Dwayne. I thought he was maybe the most unexpected character in the group. He's a little bit older. He certainly doesn't look like the other characters. He's from Texas and he's, is he a military vet? You kind of get the impression that he might be. So where did this guy come from and, and how, what role do you think he plays? Yeah, I think Dwayne is a very important character in the film because one of the things we wanted to approach is that, especially in the political climate of contemporary United States, We've flattened a very multidimensional space of agreement and disagreement and material interest onto a sort of two-dimensional left-right axis that is often broken down in terms of cultural signifiers more than it is about substantive desires and, again, organizing around material interest. And part of what I think is aspirational about this group is that the people who are in it agree what should be done, even if they don't necessarily agree on why, and that they are able nevertheless to come together to do the thing that they agree should be done. It's only very recently in this country that environmentalism has been a strictly left issue. Like there is a long tradition of conservation and stewardship over the land and conservative politics. And so I think that part of why I like having Dwayne in the movie is because it's unexpected, but I don't think it necessarily should be. Can you talk about the mostly happy ending? That was something that Andrew and I had discussed a little bit, especially in regards to other environmental direct action movies. Usually things end badly for whoever is participating. They get crushed under the thumb of government or they accidentally kill themselves or they kill themselves on purpose. I've heard right. you say that that was an important difference for you, that you wanted to show that. What was your thinking there? I think this was one of the things that honestly appealed to me most about the project to begin with, because there are so many stories of, of infighting on the left, and it's not that that's unrealistic and that it doesn't actually happen. But movies are a place where people get to engage in a little bit of wish fulfillment and a little bit of hopeful or optimistic storytelling around topics that they care about. I mean, there are plenty of very propagandistic films that are about, you know, I mean, if you look at movies like Top Gun Maverick, for instance, there are so many stories that we can point to that are terribly unrealistic and that have really happy endings in part because they are meant to, to prop up 
usually people who are in positions of power and the dominant ideology. And in this case, I think we wanted to engage in a little bit of Hollywood storytelling, but from a very different political standpoint, and actually offer up a version of a story in which activists don't immediately wind up in the hands of the cops or have their operation fall apart due to infighting. So it is a little bit about basically trying to offer up at least the sense of possibility to audience members that it would be conceivable that environmental activists could band together and actually achieve something based on their common interests. Our conversation with the creators of How to Blow Up a Pipeline continues after the break. Today's episode of Non-Toxic is sponsored by Fruley, a New York-based snack company making next-level trail mix with heirloom varieties of nuts, berries, and whole-roasted cacao beans. This type of quality is normally reserved for Michelin star chefs, but Fruley sources directly from small organic farms in the most mineral-rich regions of the world. Find Fruley products at select boutiques and health food stores or order directly online. Listeners can use the code NONTOXIC, that's in all caps, for 20% off orders at fruling.co slash shop. Fruling, naturally delicious. I want to talk about the reception of the film. I heard, Daniel, that you like to check Letterbox a lot. You know, you mentioned audiences, why they would want to actually go to the theater to see a film. What, what have you thought about the reviews, both from audiences and from critics? Like, are people getting it? By and large, I've been most heartened by the reaction the movie has gotten from activists. I think people who felt very seen and supported by the film, who think that the film is a really valuable messaging tool, not for blowing up pipelines, but for understanding why people do direct action. There's also been a tremendous amount of criticism. Some of it is really valid and really interesting. And I think, you know, engages with these really fundamental questions about the value of political storytelling today, the limitations of commercial storytelling, you know, or just the cinematic limitations of the film. And then there's been a lot of bad faith criticism and some of that's annoying, but it's also, you know, I think that none of us think that this is a perfect movie, but I think we're all really proud of the movie. And I think that when people engage with what the film is doing on a good faith level, I think the conversation rocks because that's why you make a movie like this. And I think when you get bad faith criticism, you just try to ignore it or laugh about it. So speaking of laughing about bad faith criticism, I saw Fox News had an on-air panel about the movie. Did you expect this kind of thing that you guys would become fodder for conservative and, and far-right media? I think there's no way to make a film like this and not expect that Fox News is going to take notice of it, at least if it does well enough that anyone is taking notice of it. If you get a theatrical release as a small indie film about people engaging in direct action against fossil fuel infrastructure, I, I'm sure that there are plenty of people on, on the right who would really enjoy to go off about it. So I think that was something we we're really expecting. And if anything, I mean, I've, I found it somewhat entertaining, to be honest. I think it's I think it's kind of amusing to see people try to contend with these ideas having not actually seen the movie. I'm curious to hear about like your thoughts on this issue of raising awareness. This is something Daniel that you kind of touched on at the very beginning of our conversation with that scene where Dwayne is being interviewed or Dwayne and his wife are being interviewed about losing their land to the eminent domain to build a pipeline and the filmmaker is pushing them to relive this really painful experience. Okay, so take me back to that moment, being forced to leave, that powerlessness. I don't, I don't know if I want to go there. Well, it's important. For what? We're trying to put a human face on this crisis. It helps. I mean, this is our lives. We lost our home. We had to move in with my mom. We got thousands in legal bills. Are y'all gonna help with that? I wish we could. But we, we're an organization telling stories. Yikes. I kind of felt like it was a moment of self-awareness on your part. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Part of, I think, the problem with 
a lot of contemporary documentary and Dan to some extent speaks about this better than I do because he's worked in contemporary documentary a lot more than I have. But I think that that part of the issue is that documentary films engage with the real world and rely on real people. And uh, there are, I think, much more complicated moral questions that you get into when like, that's your contract both with subject and with the audience. I think that in this contemporary moment, we've been looking for our art to be really binary, to be really like impact driven, especially if it's political, to say like, okay, there's this movie and I watch movie and I do thing and conscience good, I'm good person. And I think that that has been really damaging both to, I think, the like ecosystem of cinema, but also to our political ability to like engage with art and do what art does best, which is shape culture. And it does that in ways that I think are unpredictable and strange and often, you know, you don't see the results of for some time. A really dumb example of this is I was on a panel recently with, it was like a mix of scientists and artists panel. And there were there were two climate scientists on the panel. And one was a, a woman like my age. And she was talking about the value of film to her. And she said that she saw the day after tomorrow in 2004 when she was like 10. And that radicalized her. And she decided to become like to dedicate her life to climate science. I think that's so interesting because I think that like you can look at a movie like The Day After Tomorrow, which is a film that like also probably did some damage to the notion of what climate change looks like because it like it makes us think, oh, climate change is like New York City, like becoming Antarctica overnight, which is obviously not the reality of the situation. But at the time, that was probably the only like Hollywood way to like address the problem. Either way, it's like you look at a movie like that and like, okay, well, that did get this person kind of dedicating their life to to this cause in this way. And it's very hard to know how these things actually shake out at the end of the day. But ultimately, it's it's up to audiences to digest that and to do something with it. And I think that the place where this differs from a movie that's about raising awareness is I think a movie that raises awareness is all about making you feel better by having seen the film. I see the film, I understand the problem. And I think that the hope with Pipeline is that that's, you can't kind of leave the theater just feeling like good because the implication of the movie, if you do feel good after the film, is that there has to be an escalation of tactics in the climate movement. And if that's the case and the stakes are what they are, that does have like personally indicting implications that I think are interesting and exciting. Let's talk about that question. I think this is a film that does advocate the destruction of property in the face of fossil-fueled climate disaster. Many people would characterize this view as extreme. Andreas Malm is pretty confident, and I think you are in your adaptation of his work, that in the future, people won't be so squeamish and that the effects of climate change, as they get worse, that moral calculus will shift in the favor of sabotage. And there's a quote from the book that I was thinking of where he says, will those in school today or born next year grow up to think that the machines of the fossil economy were accorded insufficient respect? Do you think it's possible to predict the way the characters do in this film, how their actions are going to be understood or received in the future? Yeah, I mean, the characters have a conversation about that, about how they're going to be viewed in the future in part because I think you have to really think about and care about that in order to bring yourself to do an act like this that is difficult and requires sacrifice. But they ultimately don't resolve that conversation because, yeah, I don't think that you can. No, they're going to call us terrorists because we're doing terrorists. Who cares what they call us? I ain't hurt nobody. Boston Tea Party, they were terrorists of their day. They didn't hurt anybody. Patriots. MLK was called the terrorist. He was on the FBI watch list. Why well, he was like nice. No, 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 no. He was he was freaking ruthless. I'm sorry. You're trying to equate civil rights movement to what we're doing here. I mean, Look, it's kind of similar. Anytime anyone has challenged authority, they call it terrorism. And then and then when the terrorism works, they lie about the legacy and they say that it was all passive, nonviolent, kumbaya shit. When it's if not. If the American Empire calls us terrorists, then we're doing something right. 
you brought up you brought up young people and and having gone through the American educational system, I think we all were told that the only and the exclusive way to achieve massive social progress is through a strict adherence to nonviolence and civil disobedience is okay as long as it doesn't cross this line. And I think that among young people today, you know, you said moral calculus. I think that we are seeing these two things put on scale, property rights versus the right to a livable future. And I think for, for, for many young people, there's simply no comparison. And part of what is to me very salutary about Andreas's book is that it is so full of historical examples. It's about the militancy of the UK suffragette movement who were torching post boxes and then after further setbacks escalated to full scale systematic campaign of campaign of arson, right? And I think if you think about that too, you say, okay, well, was losing that property that the suffragettes burned worth breaking the male franchise on the vote? And I think that thinking of that as a parallel to this question is something that Andreas's book is able to bring into the conversation, is able to bring this historical viewpoint in to, to help us think, well, if we can look back on that, what might it be like to look back on this in the future? Right. So crucially, I think one big part of Andreas's argument is that there are a lot of these movements that are remembered erroneously as being completely pacifist. And so much of this history is actually quite whitewashed. If something like this were to succeed, very often, I, I would imagine that these people would not be remembered as being terrorists, as they would probably be labeled in the present day. They actually might not be remembered at all. And in fact, the mainstream climate movement would probably re be remembered in their stead, even if the tactics of property destruction ended up succeeding in securing some of those gains. I want to end with kind of a, I guess it's a trope in media, right? End on hope, right? They always, interviewers always want to do that. But I think it's a question worth thinking about because a lot of pieces have come out recently, both in kind of popular media, but also scientific articles that have walked back some of the worst case predictions about climate and have taken second looks at specifically like the far edges of some of the models where things were looking particularly catastrophic. I think David Wallace Wells wrote a piece where he talked about stepping away from that. And there's been a few pieces that have come out against doomerism and seeming to either suggest that some people were overselling the risks or they've shifted into a kind of like techno optimism. And I'd like to hear where you all are since this movie started gestating. I think it's possible to get too Pollyannish about our technological ability to overcome the problem. And I think that it being such a large scale and abstract problem, it is actually very difficult to come to a point where you can not only conceptually understand, but actually feel the weight of the problem. And so I think the, w without, without picking into the fine points of the science, I think we do know that we have a civilization scale problem. Yeah. Jordan, I love what you were saying. I think that the one thing that we actually can control in the here and now is how much carbon we're actually putting into the atmosphere. We can control our our emissions. And I think that it's important to remember that this is this is kind of the space in which action needs to occur. I think Rebecca Solnit is somebody who actually writes very well about this, that there are these two poles of optimism and pessimism, both of which cause people to withdraw from public life and, to, and not to engage in any action. If you're optimistic and you believe that problems are going to be solved without any of your own involvement or say, then you won't do anything. And if you believe that all hope is lost and that there's nothing that you can do to avert catastrophe, then you also will withdraw. But in between those two is the space of hope in which you realize that actions in the present day can secure a more livable future. And I think that that is exactly where we're living and where we need to keep our heads at, which is definitely how I'm emerging from, from this project. And I think that that's kind of what we have right now is a strong addiction to, to, to not just fossil fuels, but to a way of living that is fundamentally unsustainable. And I think the kind of technocratic principle of like, oh, we'll 
we'll be able to somehow engineer our way out of this is is kind of like saying oh well i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna switch from cigarettes to vaping it's like i'm i'm destroying my lungs either way you know i think it's it's what what is necessary is a is a different way of constructing a a system of how we live that's going to happen one way or another whether we like it or not it's just a question of whether or not it's a question of how much collateral damage there is i want to ask one last question which is to have you sort of put yourselves in the shoes of the uh, activists who were blowing up the pipeline, but in relation to your film, which is, I want you to think, to speculate a little, a little bit about how you think this film will be remembered as an object, a cultural object coming out at this particular time and place and where it sits in the long arc of climate culture and what it might mean 10 years 15 years, 20 years from now? I think, I can only speak for myself. I'm not really thinking about the legacy of this project because I think that I'm just trying to really focus on the immediacy of it, the immediacy of, you know, what are activist groups on the ground that like want to do screening and fundraiser events with this movie? You know what I mean? And that's going to, that's going to be an ongoing process for years with the film so i think it's like you never really know how posterity will handle a work of art i think we're all a little more focused on the future of the movement than thinking about kind of how people are going to remember our movie in 30 years maybe the maybe the most hopeful thing is that there's anybody less to remember it at all yeah I mean, I, I definitely have a hope here, which is that in, in 50 years or something, people will remember this as a very entertaining movie starring a bunch of actors who went on to have great careers, but that is ultimately kind of quaint because it's about a problem that is no longer relevant because we've, we've solved climate change. People came to their senses. Nobody had to blow up any pipelines. That would be great. I guess that's a job for me and Andrew. Guys, thank you so much for taking the some time this afternoon to talk to us about the film. I hope we got to get everyone's voice. It was really interesting hearing your perspectives. And yeah, I hope, hope the next film is, is just as provocative and, and, and that this one continues to have a life of its own. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. How to Blow Up a Pipeline. It's available at all the usual streaming services. Great interview, Daniel. Thank you for handling all the, the Daniels involved in that, in that conversation as well. My pleasure. You know, something that was really interesting and it struck me at the very end there, and Dan Garber mentioned it, and, and I think he talked about it a little bit earlier in the interview, was this idea that, you know, looking back in history... There were these events that might have seemed very extreme at the time, but now, you know, with a hundred years between them and us, they, they seem a little quaint. Yeah, I think for me personally, I definitely oscillate between what Dan was talking about of either like total hopelessness or a kind of indifferent optimism where in either case, I am not really implicated. That's that's my usual default way of thinking. And I do think the film prompts you to ask yourself like what you personally are willing to do and to connect the kind of abstract and often very diffuse system of energy production and consumption to your own personal well-being. I often walk around my neighborhood and I see these SUVs and I feel quite tempted as the way the film opens to, if not, you know, knife them, then at least let the air out of the, out of the tires. But I also never carry around the pamphlets that the characters do. And I think it would be quite dangerous to just let someone's air out and not let them know. So I haven't, um, I haven't become a vigilante yet, but you know, I'm contemplating it. 
Yeah, I feel like I'm glad you brought that scene up in the beginning because in the grand scheme of the film, it kind of just hangs there, right? It's It, it opens, it, it builds suspense. You know, is she going to get caught? Is she not? But again, it, it goes back to this question of what we as individuals you should do to deal with this crisis. And and what is possible? I think to me, that's that's what the film shows is that centrists and even the left have such a blinkered imagination when it comes to what is an appropriate response to literally a life and death situation. Like carbon credits ain't going to cut it, you know? And I think we have to face that that reality. And I think when you don't when you don't acknowledge those feelings of urgency and you are instead offered these kind of milk toast or totally nonsensical solutions to this planetary crisis, it it creates this feeling like you're insane. And then you you just sort of like turn in on yourself. They say like depression is rage turned inwards and like it's good to see the rage turned outwards like and redirected to the targets that actually should be held responsible yeah well said speaking of redirecting rage speaking of texas speaking of individual responsibility a pretty special episode coming up next week daniel what are we going to talk about well I've heard that there are going to be some feral hogs. I've heard that there might be some machine gunning from helicopters and even a certain Texas celebrity by the name of Ted Nugent. All right, that's it for our show then. We'll see you next week. Non-Toxic is a production of Loose Thread Studios, hosted by me, Daniel Penny. And me, Andrew Lewis. Art is by Sam Creasy, music by Nathan Sharp. Today's episode of Non-Toxic is sponsored by Fruling, a New York-based snack company making next-level trail mix with heirloom varieties of nuts, berries, and whole-roasted cacao beans. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash non-toxicpodcast where you can sign up to receive our monthly newsletter, exclusive merch, and more. And please make sure to rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps people find the show, but nothing does that better than telling somebody you know about it. Help us spread the word. <laughs>